Good evening and a warm welcome to yet another biography event. My name is Thad Zolkowski, and I am the Associate Director of the Leon Levy Center for Biography, a wholly unique institution hosted by the Graduate Center of the City of New York and founded by Shelby White and the Leon Levy Foundation in 2007. I wanna thank Shelby for her steadfast support of, of the Biography Center. It is her vision that makes this program possible. Please note that our next event will be a discussion between two former Leon Levy Fellows, Rebecca Donner, who has written a biography of her aunt, great aunt, Mildred Harnack, uh, who was a resistance fighter against the Nazi regime. And she will be discussing that book with Ruth Franklin, who wrote an award-winning biography of Shirley Jackson. And this is on September 8th at 6 p.m. Please mark your calendars and register for this free virtual event on the Leon Levy website. But tonight we are here to celebrate and explore a relatively new genre, one that has been on the rise in recent decades, the surf memoir, which, which incorporates aspects of nature and sports writing, travel writing, spiritual autobiography, and the soci sociology of subcultures, and in my case, addiction memoir. I am delighted to have as interlocutors tonight two fellow surf memoirists of note. Diane Cardwell is a former reporter and editor for the New York Times, an inaugural writer of Portraits of Grief, the signature profiles of those killed in the 9-11 attack. She has also covered alternative energy, politics, crime, urban development, the borough of Brooklyn, the New York hospitality industry, and even surfing focusing on how new priorities, tastes, policies, and technologies change people's lives. She was a John S. Knight Fellow at Stanford University and before coming to the Times, an editor at Seven Days, an award-winning New York Weekly, a founder of Vibe, and an, arts and, and, and an arts and entertainment contributor and editor at several major magazines. She lives, gardens, and surfs in Rockaway Beach, New York. We're going to hear all about that. Michael Scott Moore is the author of a comic novel about LA, Too Much of Nothing, as well as a book about surfing, sweetness and blood, which we're gonna hear about tonight, which was named a, ho which is named a best book of 2010 by The Economist. He's won Fulbright, Logan and Pulitzer Center prize grants for his nonfiction, McDowell and Wallace Foundation fellowships for his fiction. He grew up in California, but worked for several years as an editor and writer at Spiegel Online International in Berlin. Kidnapped in early 2012 on a reporting trip to Somalia, Moore has held, was held hostage by pirates for 32 months. The Desert and the Sea, a memoir about that ordeal, was published in 2018 by HarperCollins. So we're going to talk, the three of us, for about 40 minutes, and then I'll turn it over to questions, which will entertain for about 10 or 15 minutes and end around 7. Please post your questions in the chat and I will see them. You can send them directly to me or to everyone. And I guess that's the only thing I would add except to thank the Leon Levy Foundation again for funding this event and all our events and to look for these books that we'll talk about tonight on um, independentbookstores.org, which I'll, I'll post a link of. So let's begin. Um, I guess the first question I have for, let's start with Diane, is about the appeal of surfing to you as a subject matter. Just like, how did you come to write a surfing uh, memoir? Well, it was sort of funny. I, um, I grew up in Manhattan, didn't really care about surfing, was never interested in it, and then stumbled upon it in middle age, kind of um, strange, just working on an assignment in Montauk and um, ended up, even though I was terrible at it, um, ended up falling in love with it and, and it, I became kind of obsessed immediately. And so, you know, this was pretty much all I lived and breathed for, for several years. I ended up moving from Brooklyn to Rockaway, um, got, you know, living through Sandy. So, so I, it, it was so on my mind and I had learned so many things and thought it was fascinating and so, part of it was trust, just wanting to kind of animate and share this joy that I got to feel. Um, also that I was able to reinvent my life in middle age, which is I think, you know, through this, this kind of passion and avocation. Um, and also that 
writing a surf memoir allowed me to, as you, as you said, um, to write so many other different ways. So there are aspects of, of you know, travel and history and culture and codes and, um, you know, really bad weather and how to wait and the physics of how waves are formed and the cycles of the tides. And so it felt very rich um, in terms of the kinds of subjects that I could bring in through this one really intense activity. And you mentioned before we started um, the presence in the back of your mind of Eat, Pray, Love as a kind of model book. Talk a little about that angle of it. Right. So that um, a friend of mine, in fact, when I was she, you know, friends of mine actually had su suggested to me that I write a surf memoir before I, I really thought of it. And she was like, you could be your Eat, Pray, Surf. And <laughs> so, <laughs> so I did have that in, in mind as a kind of, you know, a, a woman overcoming a hurt and kind of taking herself out into the world and going different places. And, you know, so we get to meet some of the people that she meets and go to these places. And so there was a sense of that kind of rich travelogue, but also a very strong emotional journey. Um, right, you know, right. Had many ups and downs. Yeah, that's that. I feel like with that question, I got to something that is necessary for all books unless you're some kind of you know real you know just automatic writer book there are people who write super easily but most writers have to have a really deep uh, emotional connection to the work in order to finish it you know it's very demanding to write a whole book to sustain that energy and focus and so the psychology of book writing is often turns on some really deep emotional connection and i feel like with that template, the Eat, Pray, Love template, I was kind of hearing about what yours was there. Um, Mike, what, what about you? What was the appeal of surfing as subject matter to you? And maybe you can talk about the emotional mechanism at the heart of it. Well, I, the emotional mechanism, mechanism was probably just that I grew up with surfing and it didn't occur to me until I had the idea for Sweetness and Blood uh, to write about it. So um, I, it, it wasn't a, a topic in my mind until all of a sudden it was. And then it became this surprising lens to look at the world through because the, the focus of Sweetness and Blood is very specific. It's about how surfing arrived in about eight or nine different countries. Um, and it, it, it was motivated by the fact that I grew up in Redondo Beach, which at least according to mythology is where surfing started on mainland uh, America. Uh, there was there's one specific surf pioneer you can point to and I'd known about him since I was 12 you know and I, I was living in Germany in Berlin and when I learned there was a surf scene there I thought well then who's the first surfer in Germany that's got to be a story and it turned out it was and I, I had already been to Indonesia and I wondered about the surf first person there and when I started to think about surf pioneers in places where you wouldn't expect to find surfing at all, including Israel and the Gaza Strip, um, pretty soon I had a really good idea for a book. And it, it was a book about surfing, something I knew about and felt passionate about, but also about a lot more. Um, it was a lens to look at um, how American pop culture, first of all, had spread after World War II. Two of the countries I went to, Japan and Morocco, um, had basically brought surfing by force of arms, uh, in a sense, because once we had bases there after World War II, we had Marines there too who wanted to surf. And the kids in both places, Morocco and Japan, saw these people walking on water. You know, that's how they described it. And it was very magical. Um, but that's the point of the book, the title too, Sweetness and Blood. It's not a, it's, it's, it's horrible as well as wonderful. You know, this is this legacy of American influence since World War II. Um, so it was a, a lens to look at the world and to look at much, far more serious things than surfing. It's interesting, you know, what I'm hearing in your story is that uh, another common thing with writers is to want about to write about their homeland when they're away from it. So yeah. you found yourself writing about something that you grew up with in California from Berlin. Exactly. And, I, and it's, it's quite probable it would be consistent with literary history if you wouldn't have it wouldn't have hit you that way if you hadn't been abroad. Never would have. You saw America, saw American colonialism, saw surfing as as this sort of vehicle for saying a lot of other things. And I, I remember seeing the proposal for this book uh, being, a friend of mine had gotten a copy and I thought, oh my God, this is so clever. I wish to God I had thought of this. I get to travel around the world. This guy's got the, and, and the, the 
the thing that I admired about it as a frame was just the concept of surfing spreading along with pop culture, along with colonialism, and also that it gave you an excuse to travel. Right. Right. And so that you, you had this travel budget built into it. And I thought this book has everything. <laughs> I really envied that. And so I, I really looked forward to it coming out and um, I love the book, but um, so in terms of like, an, if you were to kind of feel a sort of identify an emotional connection to the subject matter, though, it seems it's kind of, is it like, is it kind of like a mix of, of pride in, in, in Californian, you know, dias surfing diaspora mixed with a sort of more complex, maybe shame about American colonialism and domination of world, what, like, talk a little about like how you were held by it though. Was it your American identity abroad that made that seem fraught? Yes, partly. It, it, it gave it, it, it brought that tension um, between, you know, the good things that had spread since, since the Second World War and, as well as the bad things. Because in every case, um, you know, it was, it was about culture clash in, in almost every case. And in every case, the, the, the locals who had learned to surf had new ideas about what it meant to be free. And that, mm -hmm. that's an instance where, you know, the, the rhetoric about America was, was not wrong, but it came from a sport that Americans sort of despised when it first came out. If you're a surfer, you're mm -hmm. sort of a dirt bag, you know, mm -hmm. it was not, it was not like we exported baseball and said, this is about freedom. It, this happened completely organically. Yeah. Um, so it was, it was partly about that. Um, but when it comes to pride, I'm not so sure that that, that had a bit of irony in it. Um, a prof professor of mine when I was in school, a German professor, um, wrote a very tongue-in-cheek book about how his town, Erfurt in Germany, was the center of, of all the general sort of directions. South of Erfurt was, this, was the European South, north of Erfurt, Erfurt was the north, and he, his hometown was the center of the world. And it's a very funny book. Um, uh, so I approached it from that point of view. Well, in, in some sense, Redondo Beach is, this, is the center of, of um, modern surfing, not surfing as a whole, um, not Hawaiian surfing. And I knew that by claiming that, I would piss a bunch of people off. So, uh -huh. so that was in the back of your mind to be kind of a bad boy. You're going to be, uh, it was going to be a little controversial that you were claiming Redondo Beach. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I among surfers. It would, I knew it would anger people in Huntington Beach, which is, isn't even very far away, as well as Santa Cruz, as well as Australia, and it did. Um, no. But I, you know, I, I buck up my argument. So. Yeah, no, you do, you do. <laughs> um, for me, I mean, you know, the emotional connection, uh, well, certainly in this last book, was just the, the the really the really powerful hold surfing had over me that I think is in a, that is on the spectrum of addictions. I'll give you an example of what I mean by that. Like tomorrow, um, the Elsa is coming up the coast and uh, there's gonna be a little surf, Not nothing huge, nothing great, but enough to get me to load up the car and go down to the beach and, and, and it's a hurricane surf, so, so there could be some power to it. And this has got me, like my whole body right now is a little bit like lit up. I'm very, very excited about this in a, in a kind of low grade way. And I know that that is an, a feeling of addiction, you know, like the, the kind of psychophysiological hold of surfing on me is so real. It kicks in days before surf arrives. And I was fascinated by that. And then the connection of that to my drug and alcohol addiction. And then the way surfing helped me you know, get sober and, and quit drug and alcohol later in my adult life. So I had this kind of poet in the city period in which I thought I'd never surf again. And then I kind of embraced surfing with both arms in order to revise that identity. Yeah. So that was the kind of complex thing I was trying to get at in this latest book about surfing. Um, and uh, I feel like the emotional intensity of that was super rich because there are so many other surfers like me who had problems with addiction, who regard surfing as an addiction, the whole, and I think Diane was kind of um, alluding to this in her initial reaction, which was, I did and thought about nothing else for two or three years. And to me, I thought that was really great. What I love about her book is the way it can, surfing can take uh, kind of possession of one, even as an adult. It wasn't just that I was 10 years old that I became a surf addict. It's something in surfing, right? 
Um, and I have my theory about what that something is that I lay out in my book, but um, I'd love to hear your, your thoughts on that, uh, Diane. Maybe you could say more about like what you think held you captive if surfing is maybe that maybe surfing is a call surf memoir is a captivity narrative <laughs> <laughs> that's a good way of thinking about it um well it's funny you talking about about hurricane um about elsa and you know the hurricane swell and i i am i am actually away from rockaway right now and and i am on my way to iowa which is like the least coastal place you could possibly go and i it like it pains me i mean i can't surf like big strong hurricane surf but I, but you know just being away from the water and not being able able to to I, I don't i mean i honestly don't know what it is but what i but what i do think is that I mean, it's it's basically it's energy moving through water that you somehow harness and get to get to be part of, and you you know and and I go on at some length <laughs> in the book about how that happens and you know why and what it's from and all of that. But I don't think you need to understand that to sort of feel this. It's like a motor that comes out of. The depths of the ocean that you know is connected to the cosmos, and so, and I think that there is something that you can feel, like the energy is somehow you can feel it coming from water to board, you know, to your feet and moving you through the through the air in a way that you shouldn't be able to do, mm -hmm. right? We're not supposed to be able to walk on water, and so, but but we can and we can fly. And so that, for me, that was the thing that was so addictive. Um, but also, you know, part of what happened to me was that I discovered Rockaway Beach. And, you know, I'm a lifelong New Yorker, but I didn't, I, I mean, I knew of Rockaway, I'd been to Rockaway, but I didn't know you could surf there, right? The idea of surfing in New York City was just completely foreign to me. And what I found there was a really rich history of, of surfing and kind of carnival fun, you know, endless summer times and a community of people who were committed to that. And that was something that I was really missing in my life at that, at that point. Um, you know, I was divorced, I was childless, I didn't know how I was gonna be happy again. And suddenly I'm doing this thing that made me really happy. And I was surrounded by other people who were doing that thing and being supportive of me in it. And so that, and I didn't feel that I, I didn't feel that way pretty much anywhere else. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, um, what you you're kind of getting at something that I think is also often in the profile of a surfer, which is something to uh, some kind of trauma, something to overcome, some kind of disease. Um, Mike, can you speak to that at all? Do you do you do you try to address the sort of origins of your um, your investment in surfing or your being in a, a surf initiate? Do you agree with that theory of surf oh, connect? Okay. Absolutely, but I, I probably wasn't thinking about it until I got out, got out of Somalia. When I first started to surf, it was only a couple of years after my father died. Um, I, we moved from one part of LA to another after he died, and by when I was 12, and by the time I was 14, I was learning to surf. There was no conscious connection there, but I'm sure right. that it was therapeutic now, because ever since I got back from Somalia, I, I know that surfing has been therapeutic. and. Um, I've gotten involved, like you said, we went to Camp Pendleton a couple of years ago. Um, and uh, that's where a local group here in the South Bay tries to um, help wounded warriors on the Marine base. There's a whole battalion called the Wounded Warrior Battalion um, that are suffering from PTSD, get over it through various you know, physical activities. And one of them is, is surfing and the ocean is, has something about it. Everyone who's drawn to that seems to agree. Uh, agree. And, um, one aspect of what you, you note in your book, which is that duality, it's addictive, but it also helps you overcome an addiction. That's, mm -hmm. what, that's what those guys notice at Pendleton, too. I remember one ex-Marine who'd been in Vietnam who was coaching those guys when I was down there um, saying, you know, in, in battle, it's chaos and you don't know what's going on and your life is at risk. And in the ocean, it's chaos, but it's with a smile. <laughs> yeah, right. And that, that helps a person recover. Um, right, right. It's, uh, I, I, and it, it happens without us thinking about it, which is nice. Mm 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, for sure. It's not, it's not conceptual in that sense. It's very physical. And I think the thing that I experienced and during that day we spent with the wounded warriors in Camp Pendleton is that, you know, trauma of the kind that you, and you, um, get in war, war, I think maybe generally, but the more severe the trauma, the more the brain is replaying it like a kind of tape, like a tape on a loop. And the looping of the trauma as if to kind of figure out how to overcome it or how to win is uh, becomes unbearable. And how do you deal with this unbearable looping thing in your brain? You, you can try drugs, but they don't really work. You can try other things, but nothing kind of stops. And, and, and what happens when you're in the waves is your brain has to be in the present moment in order to survive because you might drown. I mean, it's a continuous reality in the water. Uh, we may be kind of coming from the ocean, but we are not aquatic really, right? The other thing that I noticed in, in teaching, helping those guys learn to surf was when you're wiping out and you're thrust underwater and you're ragdogged by a wave, your brain is also kind of shaken there's a way in which you're kind of cleared and you come up from that wipeout and you have not been able to play the tape. And in that little gap that, uh, this is the way neurologists talk about it, the brain can revise itself. Its script is revised. There's a little moment of opening that is not a given. You can go to your grave with the trauma looping in your brain. A lot of people commit suicide. A lot of people get into all sorts of terrible behaviors to try and deal with that. But if you can be shaken loose of it, the brain has, it, has, a, has the ability to revise and rewrite its synaptic connections and to loop, to connect it to surfing in this case as pleasure, as pleasurable chaos. And I was really, um, that, I found that profoundly instructive. Conceptually, it does not, if it does not really, you know, it's not meaningful in the sense that I'm excited to go to surfing tomorrow for Elsa, but it's meaningful at the level of like sort of seeing having there be some form of hope for people who are suffering uh, in one form or another. And I do think that I came to surfing as a reaction to some degree of trauma. My parents had been divorced. I was dealing with a kind of ominous stepfather. I was happy to be in the ocean and I was kind of downcast to be going home. I'd be like dragging my feet, looking at my feet. <laughs> I didn't want to go back home. I wanted to stay out there. And uh, I think that people who have some degree of that kind of home life or some degree of issue find in surfing an extra, like they find a foothold and a community as Diane was saying, uh, there are a lot of levels of it, but I think in just the act of surfing itself is so demanding that you be in the present that you are relieved of suffering. Right. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Right. I was just thinking that it's like, it's, it's, it is, I mean, many things take, pre take presence, but, but surfing is like, it's, it seems to me, there's nothing that takes more being present and in the moment than surfing because everything's changing right like you you cannot focus on really anything else <laughs> right and right right i know that's that's its blessing is that you have to really be in the moment in that way um um now in terms of what in, in terms of the actual writing the the, the memoir there's the problem i had a, a a kind of big issue around how much of this insider jargon how much of this as an inside subculture, do I get ethnographic about how much do I translate? How much am I an insider or an outsider like straddling it? And I think that all three of our books are written out of some degree of alienation from surfing. We're not like, I, I feel like every book I write about surfing, I know that there's a certain portion or percentage of the surf community is going like, this guy's not a real surfer anymore. He's a dilettante. He doesn't surf every single day. He doesn't live at the beach. But I always, but I've started to realize lately, but that's the very aspect of my life that makes me able to write about it. It's, it's, that, it's a bit of an alienation effect. And I think that you see that in Mike in Berlin with that distance, but also in your case, Diane, coming at it as an adult and as a, as, um, a foreigner to it, to that community, right? And that, 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 that outsider status for an outsider form, which is surfing as an outsider kind of activity, is really interesting com kind of combustible co combination, right? Right. Well, that was, it was, I found it, I mean, it was, it was challenging to kind of figure out, well, what's like, how much do I want to try to explain? And, 
who is this book really for? And you know, I wanted, I definitely wanted it to be for a general audience, not surf insiders, but I also didn't want surfers to look at it and say and, and be like, well, this is stupid, right? <laughs> so so I had a lot of anxiety actually about, you know, which terms to use and how much to explain and all of that. But um, but I think because I was such an outsider and such a newbie to the whole scene that, um, I mean, the book is, it's almost like, I mean, I think it's almost like a buildings roman, right? It's, it's, it, is a, it is a tale of discovery. And so that made it a little bit more natural to explain some of the jargon, to explain, you know, uh, you know how things work, to explain like, why short boards look the way they do and, and you know the difference between a short board and a long board like as i'm discovering it usually um in some moment in which i just don't know what's going on right i mean part of it is that i cast myself as as i as i felt i mean i could have called this you know a bumbler in surf land like i didn't know the first thing about anything and you know people would i mean i write about like my first surf lesson the guy's like are you regular or goofy and it's like <laughs> you know <laughs> so so and i think that that is um was part of a way of one i just think making the book more engaging right for any reader two you know showing how i actually felt but three i think it helped insulate me against some of the like oh she doesn't she doesn't know what she's doing because it's like i'm all about I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> right, right, right. You foreground that, and, yeah. and you have or, you have an organic reason, and from a from a writerly perspective, to to lay out the terms and lay out the inside outside thing. So that that's that's what you have going for you with that particular book. Um, in terms of the the sense of um, being a newbie, talk a little about what you under what you experienced of surfing as as a culture of of in a way a very severe culture you know it's, it's very um hostile to what we call kooks um because you know a new uh, a rank amateur in the midst of surfing is a danger right i mean that's the justification i think is like the reason a beginner is frowned upon is because everything can be put in peril by this beginner but i don't know if that really accounts for it the culture of the kook and uh, and the, the sort of the authentic journeyman surfer and all that. So maybe you can talk a little about how your experience of being um, an outsider and how maybe Rockaway is a bit of an exceptional surf community in that way, right? Well, that's that's actually what I think it is, is, this, is that now, now certainly there are people and, um, you know, maybe some cliques <laughs> who surf certain breaks who, who are more or less hostile. And, you know, my, my, my neighbor, Buddy, who was a long time surfer in Rockaway, right? Like they used to, you know, it's like he has had been known to like, you know, slug a guy who who dropped in on him or, you know, mm -hmm. cut him off while, at, you know, on a wave. So there, you know, I think that there used to be a little bit more of that kind of thing going on in like the 60s and 70s when, when um, you know, when Buddy was surfing. But, but I think, first of all, there's a sense in Rockaway that one, the waves aren't really very good. And mm -hmm. so like, what are we really fighting over? Mm -hmm. um, and, and two, that if you have committed to live in Rockaway, you kind of get a pass and mm -hmm. people are kind of decent to you. At least that, that was my experience, right? And, and I was not very aggressive. I knew I didn't know what I was doing. So I, 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 went, I took a lot of lessons and then I would go into the water and I would, try to sit off to the side and make sure and you kind of get the sense of where things were breaking and where I might be able to catch, try to catch a wave or whatever. And the old guys, a lot of them were like, hey, come on over here, I'll show you. You seem like a nice person, right? So, but, but I think part of that was that Rockaway is, a, is in some ways a tough place to live, right? It's the edge of the city. It's a long commute to get anywhere. We are, you know, bedeviled by storms and floods. And so, there's a sense that if you if you love surfing so much that you are living here and willing to put up with what we all put up with, then you are one of us. Right. 
Well, exactly. you've become you're a, you're an actual local in that sense. Yes. I mean, yes. and so you're you're being brought along as a local, which is a special right. status. Um, Mike, can you talk a little about that topic? Yeah, I I don't like surf culture as far as that goes. I I mm. grew up in it here on the California coast, and I mean, especially in the '80s, surfers were jerks. You know, mm -hmm. um, I think that got worse, not just because of competition for waves, but like I said, when it started in the 60s and 70s, it was, or even before, it was a dropout culture. But once it became um, something to aspire to in beach towns like this one, there could be money if you were a pro, you could be cool at school and stuff like that. People really became jerks. And I, I wanted to leave all that aside. I didn't have to write about that at all, the sweetness and blood, and that was a relief. And in fact, what I didn't want to do either was, was describe riding a wave all the time. I could do that once or twice and that was it. But like you said, there, there was a reaction among readers. I noticed a couple of comments online. Like I read this whole book and I couldn't figure out how good a surfer he was. Like exactly. I, 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 I want to leave all that aside. I'm not going to go out, go out here and act like I'm being judged by a bunch of kooks in the, or good surfers actually in the, in the parking lot of my home break. Forget that. Yeah. Right, right, I'll right. Away from that. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, okay. I think I think one of the things that Diane is benefiting from too is a a, 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 a phenomenon in the last couple of decades of uh, culture workers in cities in their in their thirties taking up surfing as a kind of adjunct to yoga, or you know, like a kind of lifestyle thing that is really different from when Mike and I learned uh, mm -hmm. in our in our boyhoods. Uh, surfing has changed culturally. And there are more beginners in the lineup, and there are more adults in the lineup, and that turns out to be fine. No, you know, certainly around here, Diane, on, in, in Rockaway and the East Coast. And I think that one of the beauties of the East Coast is, yes, the waves aren't as good, but you can get off on your own and surf alone or surf with people. You get a choice. It's not overrun. It's not as crowded as California. Right. Um, and that permits for it to become something slightly different, you know, more solitary, more, more inward maybe. Um, Except but I definitely, I definitely came up in a traditional hierarchical surf scene, which I had to kind of be a, approved of and anointed and so forth, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and that was interesting for me to write about. And I find lineup culture interesting because it's like, um, it's so, it's just so bestial, you know, and, and so, so like dog-like. And I find that interesting just as a, as a, as a, as a scenario. Um, but as an experience, it can be very stressful and not good. Right? Yeah. Well, yeah. one of the things I, I wrote about a little bit in the book just was um, because I was just always, it was always sort of hilarious to me that, that you know, that, that aspect of it, but also um, just, you know, the kind of names of breaks and like, why would you ever want to go surf someplace called gas chambers, right? <laughs> but, but, um, but there is that kind of like tough guy image about surfing, right? And that is part of the culture. And so one of the things that I was, that I, that I wrote about was how, um, at least in my experience, how different it is to surf with women. And mm. Um, there, you know, that, that there really is not that sense of, you know, pecking order. It's like, hey, you take, oh, that looks good for you. Go get it, right? Go, 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 right? It's much more sharing and encouraging. Um, and I, I quoted a woman, a young woman surfer from a documentary that I, that I watched where she basically says, you know, when you hear about, like, when you hear about a spot being localized, She's like, it's localized by the men. There's no women in the water telling you like, go home, <laughs> right, so. Right, right, that's one of the other things about surfing that's completely changed since I was a boy, which is uh, gender, you know, just like women in the lineup. I can't remember a single girl surfing in my youth. They were all, they just it wasn't happening. And now that's really changing and it's really great. And I had an experience of that in Malibu when I surfed it for the first time uh, a couple of years ago. And uh, you know, there were, there were half of the lineup was women. It was just, I'd never seen that before. It was great. Yeah. And uh, it's, it's nothing but good. Yeah, I do think it's testosterone and testosterone excess. Yeah, yeah. That, that's, that's really changed here in California too. The, the women who surfed or the girls who surfed when I was young were tomboys. And now it's, it's not exactly 50-50, but 
um, it's more like it was in Hawaii a thousand years ago. You know, mm -hmm. when, when surfing started, um, there was there was not that break. It wasn't just an, a masculine sport at all. Uh, women surf, why not? So, but I have to say, if you go to a place like Costa Rica, which you think of as a slightly more mas macho or masculine culture, half the women, half the surfers are women. Um, mm -hmm. I feel like it's much freer. To, mentally to, to go out as a woman in Costa Rica that, than it is in LA still. And that's mm. Mm. One of the things that um, interested me this time through when I was writing about surfing is its place with regard just to the shoreline, like a structural place where I, which I talk about in terms of an anthropological concept called liminality. And I had an experience of this recently when I was surfing in um, in uh, Casino Pier, which had been destroyed. Well, I wanna to get to the ecological dimension of your book, Diane, in a minute. But I was surfing in this absence, you know, I had never surfed Casino Pier, but you know, it had this famous, really daunting pier, 300 feet out into the water. It was, the, it, it was a platform for this classic roller coaster, which is iconically, you know, there in the storm surge post Sandy, right? You know, that really iconic aerial photo of the, that's Casino Pier. So yeah, I went to Casino Pier for the first time. None of that's there. Uh, there's no pier. There are all these guys who grew up in the shadow of the pier are out surfing. And I just think like, what is this like for them? I mean, it must be this like, like this void or like an amputation or like uh, too bright or something. You know, they must have experienced all these things. But for me, it was just a surf spot. And because of the absence of the pier, it's no longer a great surf spot with locals who will guard it and so forth. But one of the things I noticed about myself, which I'd written about, which is I could look back at the shore and I was there with a friend who had grown up surfing Casino Pier and he was like, yeah, my daughter loves that roller coaster up there on the, on the platform, they have a new roller coaster. And I looked back at it and I could barely focus on it. I was like, it doesn't feel real to me and the beach doesn't feel real. The beach feels like a mirage. And, I, and there's this really interesting mesmeric kind of dimensional power of being in the surf zone which is liminal. And I think that you feel truly, and you may be in some electromagnetic way, you know, in a zone that's very specific relative to the land and even maybe to the outer surf, to the outer ocean that is different in character, the surf zone. And I was sitting there and I, and I, and I, and I noticed, and, this, and it's that aspect of it that I was trying to get at more with the relationship of surfing to addiction because addiction too puts you in a kind of liminal space, right? You're not in or out. You're in the world, but you're 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 altered and you're you're not in it. Also, if you're if you're kind of dealing with addiction, so I I felt like that was there was there was something essential about surfing in that way because it also applied to the marginality of surfers socially, and all that they give up in order to surf, living in far Rockaway. Um, or not taking a real job in order to surf, the underemployment, the conscious underemployment of surfers working in lawn maintenance, working in restaurants, working in hotels in order to be able to surf when, the, when it's good. Suddenly you turn 40, you haven't gone to college, you don't have many options, and you know, you're in this perilous, you're scrambling socially, right? That's another form of liminality. So I found that really kind of rich as a and I just wondered if that resonated for either of you. Go ahead, Diane. Well, I was going to say yes, um, in that I guess I just felt with that that surfing brought me sort of further out, brought me very far outside of any kind of zone that I had been in before, right? Where I so I felt very much like, okay, I've been working my whole life to sort of reach a kind of level of kind of middle class success, you know, and, you know, have a nice house and all this stuff. And now I'm basically saying, no, that's not important. I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm not going to go travel the world searching for waves, right? I don't want to go all the way to that edge of surf culture, but some zone in between is where I'm, is where I want to exist. Mm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. What about you, Mike? Well, when I when I was traveling, I noticed that, of course, every place I went when when I visited um, a country was on the coast, and so I was meeting people who, in some way, were used to meeting, um, if not 
all tourists and at least surfers. So, you know, the Moroccans you meet um, in a surf town are certainly going to be different from the, the very conservative religious Moroccans who live in the Sahara. Um, and that was a pattern from country to country. Uh, and at some point I compared it just to a port city as opposed to an inland city. Um, there's always a mixture of people and, and the people who live in these liminal spaces um, can sometimes actually be, become more cosmopolitan sim simply because they, they meet people. So, you know, you live in a trading town or a port town, uh, you, you meet a whole lot more people than you do inland. Um, so that actually, I had to realize that I was seeing each country through that lens, you know. Um, yeah. Of course, I have to travel around and see more than just the coast. Um, but I, I started to notice this pattern and it became a theme in tourism work. Yeah, that's interesting. I remember that part of it. I mean, uh, the, 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 the complex aspect of that with surf culture is that, you know, surfers can be very well traveled, but in this really narrow way where it's just like the coast, you know, they don't actually ever go inland. And it's sort of like they travel the world, but it's always on the coast. And so there's a kind of parochialism almost of it. But um, in terms of putting oneself outside the mainstream or putting oneself on the edge in the liminal zone. And I mean, and I, and I, I don't know how conscious it is in the sense that I do think there's a kind of possession of surfing that you're taken by it and it takes over your life. And in the absence of surfing, a lot of people's lives would be a lot more conventional and they would go into regular jobs and, and do the regular thing. But there is a way in which, you know, um, someone in, in the question in the chat was talking about the, the giving up of white privilege. Uh, you know, I do think there is something to that with surfers. I don't know that it makes them more politically progressive as a, as a group, but there is, you know, you, you, you wind up, you know, not being able to cash in certain social um, stature you have in, our cont uh, in the present culture, right? As a white male, if you're always surfing, you're foregoing a lot that you might just have given to you by your position. And that I think is instructive for this, you know, for someone that, that teaches lessons about outsiderness, right? And not being privileged, not, be, not having everything kind of handed to you because you're white and male or whatever. And I think that has made surfing traditionally more truly, um, you know, a counterculture. Yeah. So, so, that, so that surfing was an adjunct an, um, um, an annex of the youth counterculture in the 60s. It was like the bleach blonde version of that with all the drugs and everything else that went with that. Um, but in other social ways, they're, they're behind the curve with, with the acknowledgement of uh, gay rights, with the acknowledgement of surfers of color isn't very you know, widely embraced, but it's happening more and more. And re very recently, like, like a week ago, there was a kind of thing on Surfline about welcoming gay surfers. It was, it was actually to do with Pride Month. I had never seen it before, yeah. uh, but I do think that it's kind of like the long curve in surfing, you know, bending toward justice. And I would connect it I'm inclined to connect it toward liminality uh, we were talking about. To, to the extent that it's a drop, that there was a dropout culture associated with it, then first, um, then I think that's true that the white, white privilege somehow gets eroded. But uh, to the extent that it gets mainstream, then that, you know, that disappears again. Uh, but that's right. When it, when it started, uh, at least in California, surfing was connected to the beat movement. You know, it was yeah. even before the hippies. Uh, the beats on the beach were surfers. That's, mm -hmm. that's Gidget. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, is it I easier mean, to understand me, by the way? Somebody said it's hard to understand. Me. It's hard to know what, it, it, <laughs> that's fine. I think you're good, actually. I don't, I don't know what to do with that. Some of the technical limits. Um, um, the, a couple of other things have come up about um, the, the writing of it with regard to um, um, other books, you know, not, so we talked a little about like the template that you're bringing to the surf narrative. I'm interested in the ways in which you have the pressure from the experience and the pressure from the genre we're bringing to it, you know, and Diane talked about the Bildungsroman and Eat, Pray, Love, uh, I would, but, but Mike, you were talking about travel writing and the kind of the way in which in the current publishing market, it's not a really sexy, you don't, you're, you're discouraged from doing it, even though I love it. And, yeah. and your book clearly 
falls into that niche. Talk a little maybe about um, the books that you were bringing to this with regard to, because I feel like that whole concept of your book was, you know, you mentioned your professor with that ironic book about yeah. being the center of the world. Maybe that's the book. I don't know. Well, no, I was thinking about just um, straight up travel too, or travel journalism. So from from uh, Paul Theroux to V.S. Naipaul, those are all writers mm -hmm. I like. Mm -hmm. And when Naipaul goes to a, when he does a, a book about a theme like Islam, um, he goes to several different countries because he's not an expert about a, any of them. So that's that's that was part of what I was thinking when I started the book, but. I knew that I was looking every, at everything through a surf lens anyway, so that was the focus. Um, but I think my publisher had an allergy to calling it travel writing. Mm -hmm. um, so it never wound up getting categorized in the travel section. It always wound up in the sports section, which I found a little bit annoying. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and you, Diane, you, you mentioned a couple of other books before we were on on air um, uh, other than Epre Love, what were those? Right, so so the first was um, was was Barbarian Days, um, just because I think you know you can't think about writing a surf memoir without thinking about Barbarian Days, um, and 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 but I had in mind this idea that I was writing the opposite story because you know his his is a really just amazing, amazing book, right? But it's the tale of someone who discovers surfing very young and, and is good at it, and then really throws himself into it, really lives that surf life um, before, you know, kind of adult concerns uh, sort of take, take over. And mine was the opposite, where I was 45 years old, had a, you know, a mortgage and, um, you know, kind of a <laughs> life that wasn't quite where I wanted it to be. And I discover surfing and, you know, I'm terrible at it, but I still had to figure out a way to surf within, you know, the confines of a middle-aged life and, and ended up actually dropping some of those confines, right? Changing my life so that I could live at least some kind of surf life in New York City. Um, and then the other one was The Perfect Storm because um, obviously in the sort of, you know, I, I moved to Rockaway and six months later, Hurricane Sandy hit. And so I, I want, I knew that the storm was obviously going to be a big part of the book, a really important, you know, kind of dramatic moment, but, but that, so I wanted it to feel, you know, kind of like a character. And that was one of the things that I really admired about The Perfect Storm was how he, how he was able to have these kind of parallel narratives of this development of this kind of inexorable force on the horizon, but then there are these people living this life and the two of them are gonna, it's kind of convergent narratives. And so, mm -hmm. I mean, I only had that in one chapter, but so I had, I did probably the most like intense research was just reading, you know, the weather reports and going back. I read a whole book about about Sandy just so that I would be able to kind of match what I was doing as the storm itself was developing, and then you know it hits, and then you have the aftermath. Yeah, no, the ecological stuff in surfing is really. I mean, in your book is really powerful. Um, you know, can do you do you feel like the the surf memoir offers, uh, I mean, I, in, a, in a way it's obvious that it offers a kind of clear new angle on ecological issues, but because surfers are immersed in it, I think it has a certain, a greater degree of authority. It's kind of like being a dolphin who's writing or something. He's like, guess what? <laughs> Things are terrible or. <laughs> right, well, I think, I think what it offers is an opportunity to delve into you know, the ocean, how it functions, how healthy it is or isn't, but also, you know, these universal tremendous forces that we live with and, you know, are changing because of what we do. I mean, I don't, I don't talk, I don't talk very much explicitly about climate change, but that, you know, obviously <laughs> is something that affects the severity of storms and, and, uh, and, and what have you. So, so, and, and, you know, there is a kind of, I do think that when you become a surfer um, and, you know, I can't say this for everybody, but certainly for me and, and many that I see, 
you know, you spend so much time in the ocean, you start to feel responsible for it, mm -hmm. right? I mean, I don't come at it. I mean, it's it's like it's not like this is going to stop a whole lot, but it's like I come out of the out of the <laughs> out of the water with like plastic bags and my wetsuit and bathing suit, and I see other surfers doing that. And you know, there are these constant beach cleanups, and you know, worrying about dune replenishment. And so there is this sense of we want to try to save this community, but also this, you know, body of water that gives us so much joy and pleasure. So, yeah, I think that the, that turn in surfing is great. And it is fairly recent, uh, the ecological turn and also just the giving back period. And that relates to a question. I want to go to the questions now and I can give this kind of to Mike. It's from our terrific director of the um, biography and memoir um, master's program at of the Graduate Center, Sarah Covington, is, says she grew up in Southern California, and she says, I, um, I think it's important to focus on the local context of different surf cultures in addition to the universal global and psychological aspects. I'm curious about Michael's thoughts on SoCal surf culture specifically. I ask as someone who spent every summer at Balboa Beach as a child in the 70s, my brother was very much a part of the surfer scene, which in his group was oppositional and also connected to the emerging punk rock. Also, Southern California was very distinct and strange for a child and teen in the 70s and early 80s. And I think that this gets the kind of oppositional thing now is changing a little bit with regard to, you know, it's not punk anymore mm -hmm. to, there's no obvious connection to punk with beach cleanups right. or the ecological system. I mean, not in any straightforward way. What, what do you have to say on this, Mike? Well, that's true. And that's when I was a kid too, in uh, the 70s and early 80s. Um, and I came up through that sort of punk rock uh, beach culture. It was the really popular surfers were not necessarily punk rock, but there was some, you know, overlap. Uh, and the oppositional thing is something that I saw in every country I went to. So in other words, at least when a surf scene starts to get going, um, it's always anti-authoritarian. And I don't have any, any explanation for that, except that maybe they feel like, surfers feel like they're a little bit of a drop. They have to be, you know, focused to do what they want to do, and they have to be slightly apart from society. But even in Cuba, where the politics were totally different, the surfers were, you know, revolutionary, but in a different direction. Um, they were anti-Castro. Uh, uh, and they had been inspired, in fact, by a schlock movie called Point Break that came from the uh, United sure. States. But the um, once they got into surfing, they became basically anti-government, which meant, you know, in that in that context, anti-communist. So that anti-authoritarian vibe is somehow um, universal to surfing, at least when the scene gets started. I love that. I hope that's true. I mean, I, I, I'm, I mean I'm inclined to distrust that kind of generality, but I, it could well be true. And it, maybe it has to do with the liminal and the, being on the outside. Uh, well, it's well, hard to I, imagine an authoritarian surf scene. Yeah, Diane. Well, I was just going to say, I mean, I think I think part of what's happened, it's, it's, it's sort of hard to say, right? But because surf, surfing has become more mainstream and therefore and more corporate and you know so there's there there's that aspect which seems so it doesn't seem quite as revolutionary or anti-authoritarian authoritarian that is the word yeah. <laughs> as it might have been however i think there is something inherently um you know out not necessarily outlawed but a little bit rebellious because the fact of the matter is you almost cannot be a surfer and not at some point shirk some responsibility because you want to surf, right? You're just, there's just no way that you're all, you're, I mean, you are at some point going to make the decision to not do what you're supposed to do and go catch that wave. So I think there will always be a little bit of that in it. So. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And it's like someone just said, it's all about individualism and also the, the only authority is the wave in the ocean. So, um, the, those two aspects of it attract freaks. <laughs> so there's always going to be a certain um, mar marginality about it, which is good. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I had a very iconic experience of um, that shirking of responsibility on 9-11. You know, the story of 9-11 is everyone, um, no one saw it coming, right? No one saw that coming, right? We were just taken by surprise. But surfers were fully expecting something because this hurricane had been grinding up the coast all that week and the conditions were going to be flawless. And it was going to be like the wave of the decade, the swell of the decade. So I was fully intending to shirk 
my teaching duties the next day. I, there was no question about it. But the problem with that is I, I was just named the director of the writing program. I was living in this faculty house. I was suddenly like really, I was institutional up to my eyeballs. And yet I thought, I'm sorry. Those freshmen will get over my not showing up. I'll leave a note on the, I'll have the secretary leave a note on the door and they'll, they'll get over it. But if I miss this swell, I will not get over it. I'll be like forever wounded by this. So I got up, I was waiting for my friend. I would have gone out at dawn, but I was waiting for a friend who had to drop his daughter at daycare. And he wasn't getting there on time. I was waiting for him to come by. Meanwhile, the students were streaming into the campus. I was gonna have to go out there with my surfboard and my wetsuit and be obviously shirking. And then 9-11 hit, the first plane hit, and I realized I, I wasn't gonna go surfing that day. I was not, I could not go surfing that day and for a number of different, different levels, right? But some of the guys who had worked at, in finance who were surfers didn't go to work that day. That's how good the surf was, right? Even in finance, they didn't go to work and they lived, right? And that's why they lived. And that <laughs> parable, there's, some, I, I, there's a whole book right there about those, the, the people who surfed who didn't go to work and lived because the, they weren't in the building when it was uh, uh, blown up. But I went the next day and some people find even that kind of sacrilegious, but for me, it was like church, you know, like I was going to go to the mass, I was going to mass to kind of get it together. And there was a little bit of a leftover swell. And I got, I got lost going to um, Long Beach. I wound up in uh, uh, this, you know, this circular road around JFK. And all of these undercover cops jumped out of the bushes when I tried to do a U-turn to get out of there. And they're like, what are you doing? Where are you going? Why are you running away? And I said, I'm, I just, I'm just trying to go surfing. I like gestured back at my surfboard in the back of the car. And they're like, all right, go ahead, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I went surfing, and, and, but, but it was like, I, to me, there was something like it encapsulated so much that I still to this day have not worked, you know, like worked out. But um, that was my, I think I, that's my surf parable. Um, I think we are basically have time for one more question. Let's see here. Um, what about just Gidget as a phenomenon. Did that have any resonance for you, Diane? There's someone who asked about the resonance of Gidget. She says, I saw it 50 times. You know, this was the game changing cultural, this was the game changing phenomenon for surfing. It created the first surf boom. You know, population of surfers quadrupled in the 60s, yeah. right? So, so I, I remember seeing the movie, one of, I think one of, one of them and um, thinking that it was cute, but again, like, didn't really care. It didn't, it did not, it did not do any, it didn't like capture my imagination in any way. But, but when I was writing the book, I thought, you know, somewhere I have to work Gidget in here. And I ended up reading, I ended up actually going to back to the book and reading the book. And um, you know, I had, I had, you know, learned about Kathy Conner and, and, um, you know, seen her picture in that there's a book of tintypes, tintype, po po you know, portraits of surfers and she's in it. And, um, and I found this line where it's just this beautifully written line about um, realize like she was trying so hard to be a member of the group and to be like, she's the little girl who's trying to break in with the surfers or whatever. And this moment happens and she's like, I realized I, was, I wasn't a member of the group, just a, I think it was just a blind passenger. Mm -hmm. And I was like, that is the feeling that I had in my life when I, when I somehow stumbled into surfing. And so I, I grabbed that line for, for sort of one of the section intros. Yeah. Uh, I had to um, research Gidget while I was writing Sweetness and Blood, um, but growing up, I just, I didn't want to, didn't even want to think about her. You know, surfers don't like Gidget and surfers don't like the Beach Boys. They think that makes the whole thing sort of superficial. But when you look into it, actually, um, first of all, those surfers on the beach in Malibu that, that Gidget wanted to join, those were the beats and the hipsters of the 1950s. That, so there really was a lot more going on under the surface. And the interesting part is that Kathy Kohler, the original Gidget, her father, Herr Kohler, um, escaped from Berlin. He escaped the Nazis. He, he um, was a screenwriter in Berlin in the 30s, it had to be. And um, 
I think he saw a couple of credits come up on a movie that had come out under, under Hitler and a few Jewish names were missing. And he realized that that was the time to leave. And he went to Hollywood, um, like a lot of people from Berlin actually, uh, Billy Wilder included, and wound up in this completely foreign, completely weird youth culture that he wanted to understand. And once he's heard th this language around him because of his daughter, he wrote you know, this crazy book. Um, and it, actually it's a lot more interesting than the movie movies. Um, the movies get interesting, but um, mm -hmm. the, the book itself, at least the story behind it, is very interesting. Yeah. Absolutely. Owner. Yeah. yeah we're, all, yeah. we're all Gidget. Yeah. We're all Gidget. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's probably a good place to end. <laughs> <laughs> we, uh, we have to acknowledge our mother, who's Gidget. But anyway, thank you guys very much for that. That was enormously uh, stimulating and thanks to Shelby White and Leon Levy Foundation for sponsoring another of these events and we'll see you in the lineup see you out surfing all right thanks so all much right. thanks everybody thanks, thanks. good night Bye.